Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is, yeah, just wonderful to be here and feels like a special gathering. I think whenever we get to be here in person, on my way down here, I was talking with my brother who's joining us tonight. Welcome, Tom. Um, and just saying, you know, the last time I went to our old space, I had no idea it was gonna be the last time I taught there. And just how incredibly precious it is that we get to be here in this space, right? You know, my brother and I grew up in the city and we were talking about a lot of the changes. And luckily, Taqueria Cancun Vegetarian Burrito has not changed in quality, even though it might have increased in price. But just to have a space where we are welcomed to be here and that every single thing here from these beautiful air plants to even, I don't know if you notice, it's like so tidy and there's nice tea in the back. All of this is here for us to be with these teachings and create community. So to just let that sense of welcoming, uh, I really invite you here tonight. The San Francisco Dharma Collective, as Mace mentioned, is completely volunteer run. It is here in order to support this opportunity to practice and learn these teachings and build Sangha together. And one important part, I think, of, of our community here is being able to be in connection with one another, to talk and listen and receive. And just a reminder for us that it's a real goal for the center that we can create a place that is welcoming. Right, not just at the physical level with nice tea and, and cushions, but also welcoming so that we can listen and also speak our minds and hearts. So I invite us as part of our practice to really hold in mind that everything we do here tonight is the practice, not just when I ring the bell and we meditate, but also the practice of mindful listening and mindful speech. And I want to just uh, share, there's just one beautiful part. Some of you are familiar with this, these four gates of speech. Is it the right time? Is it necessary? Is it true? What's the fourth, anybody? Use. Is it time? Kind. How could we forget? So to use this opportunity here together. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's it's OK. I'm not going to judge myself on that. I'll be kind. Um, but yeah, to use our, our opportunity to connect and reflect on these practices, to think about our speech. We don't get an opportunity to do that very often. And because of our emotions, often we're just caught up and just speaking out of being in the grip. So just encouraging us to really hold that in mind. It's really important for all of us here in the collective that if there's a way that we can make this space feel more welcoming and more supportive, that you let us know. Uh, we want this to be ongoing. We've, I'd say, come leaps and bounds with being able to include our online Sangha and family here. So I think that's a big part of being able to be at ease is having that connection. And so tonight we will do some practice together and then we will do some discussion and Mace, you're the inspiration for the theme for tonight. So we, uh, you know, we've been talking about um, self-compassion and self-criticism, which is <clears throat> very prevalent. I don't know if any of you have any idea what I'm talking about, but if you don't, you certainly know someone who feels that way. So you can at least take the teachings for them. And I was noticing on our SoundCloud, we have a, a SoundCloud with free meditations for cultivating emotional balance. And the one that has the most listens is compassion for mental suffering. And it's a specific practice. Um, so Chandra and I here have been holding ourselves through the four Brahma Viharas in these last couple of weeks. But this is a compassion, not just for our experience of difficulty or the experience of difficulty that others face, but the added mental suffering that we create. So not just like I feel, you know, let's say I feel left out. I wasn't included on um, an event that I really wanted to join or, you know, no one called me and let me know when my friends were in town. That's painful the added mental suffering, the shame, the self-criticism, the blame. We will do a compassion practice for that, for that additional mental suffering. This is a practice I learned from Alan Wallace. 
it's true. It's also the one I've listened to the most of his. So on my list of his practices, that has the most plays as well. And I think it's a really beautiful way for us to start kind of meeting this practice of self-compassion. For many of us, this is an edge. It's hard to be kind towards, especially the parts of ourself we think are not good or um, haven't changed or improved fast enough. And so this ability to kind of, you know, work our way towards self-compassion through these different angles, it's um, incredibly beneficial work. One of the questions that Mace and I were talking about is, can you have compassion for others if you don't have compassion for yourself? I'm eager to hear what people say, and I think absolutely. And if we can hold it for ourselves, I think we'll have a lot more kind of uh, endurance and perseverance in our compassion for others. So if you don't feel that you particularly are worthy of or deserve self-compassion tonight, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about all the people who can use you as a compassionate being. Okay. And yeah, I just, I, I, I'm really hopeful that this is a practice you'll find useful now and maybe you'll also find useful to do in the future. So let's go ahead and give ourselves a moment to find a comfortable position. It's especially important in a practice of compassion or the other Brahma Viharas to really have a posture that supports a sense of the quality we're working towards. So consider what's the most compassionate way you can hold your body. Checking in on how it feels to your knees if you're cross-legged and maybe you need some support under the knees. Feel a sense of the ground beneath you, beneath the chair, beneath the floorboards, that real sense of the earth beneath us, that support. I'm thinking of how we want to hold our hands in a way that can support our posture, maybe resting on our knees or folded in our lap. Especially noticing how it feels for your shoulders. If you place your hands on your knees, your shoulders feel more strained. Maybe they feel better, closer to the abdomen. And feel your spine and it's lengthening. It's natural movement upward like a beautiful flower facing upward towards the sun. Feel that same sense of vibrancy. And consider one more thing you can do to make your posture feel more at ease and more supportive.
to help us settle in a bit more. Connecting to a sense of place here. For those of us inside the center, feeling a sense of the street on one side, neighbors above, and imagining whether you are at home or here with us, the hundreds of years before, the thousands of years before, how this land has held people and people have held this land. And connecting to the sense of place around time where the sun is in the sky, and for those of us here in the city, where the fog is coming over the hill. And for the next couple breaths, really connecting to this place this time. And for a little while here, allow our self to notice whatever is easy to notice through the five physical senses. Maybe we notice the sounds around us. Maybe we're more oriented towards the play of light behind our eyelids. The sensations in the body. Or the smells around us, our tea or other types of fragrance. Allow yourself to roam freely through the sensory experience moment to moment. Let the quality of this noticing be curious and kind. No need to chase down what we're hearing or receiving. But inviting a precise and vivid attention to noticing the present moment through these senses.
As we continue to make our mind serviceable through paying attention to the present moment, we'll narrow and focus just a bit more to the sensations in the body, bringing our full awareness and attention to the whole tapestry of sensations we might experience, maybe in the fingertips, maybe the back of the neck, all through the face or belly, with a gentle and curious noticing. When you become distracted by a thought or memory or image, relax, release, and just gently return to noticing sensations in the body. And to help us in our practice, let's remember that we are here for the sake of all beings and arouse that quality of bodhicitta, the awakened heart. And the dedication of these practices to extend and expand compassion. Feel the integrity and dignity of that aspiration. Without disconnecting from an experience of our body, we'll shift to the mind, imagination, and memory.
as we begin this compassion practice, it can be helpful to touch in to our innate or intrinsic capacity for caring. For some of us, just saying, arouse compassion in your heart brings forth a blossoming, that sense of boundless care. For others of us, it may be helpful to place a hand on the heart and feel that tactile connection. Maybe there's a memory or image of when we felt loved, cared for, supported. We can call upon that too. Just bringing forth this felt experience of care, kindness, and love. Not anything to be made up, just something to be revealed, which is already here. We may feel that as a warmth or brightness at the chest, or again, just as a felt sense. In this practice, we'll use our memory in order to engage with a time that we really could have used compassion. Imagining a time in which we experienced some difficulty. Maybe we felt hurt or angry or afraid. And we acted in ways we regret. We said a nasty word or got defensive or didn't know when to step back. Just let be. Maybe we didn't speak up when we feel we should have. And especially think of a time in which you then ruminated about this. Got down on yourself about it. Experienced self-criticism. Maybe even shame. Take your time and find an example can be something simple. Rumination, just that common feeling of not being able to let it go. When you have a memory like this in mind, or can even imagine feeling this way in the past. Bring it vividly to the forefront of your mind. As though you could almost feel and see that experience. Using this memory to ignite that spark of compassion in our heart. Feel and notice the suffering. For some of us, that word may feel too strong. You could call it discomfort, difficulty, or challenge. But that added layer, in addition to the hurt or anger, that cycle in which we continue to take it out on ourselves. First of all, just recognizing that it was hard to feel. Whether it was right or wrong in the first place does not matter.
allowing ourselves to simply become aware of this difficulty is huge. To be in our own sphere of care and kindness, as we would for a friend or loved one. It can help to remember that every single human being on this planet has experienced regret. And tuning back in to that sense of love in the heart, that wellspring of compassion that is truly our birthright. Drawing in that sense of compassion through our inhale, allowing it to reach throughout our entire body and through our exhale, extending compassion, washing ourselves from the outside in. Feeling these breaths as a cleansing, a support of compassion, drawing in compassion, and radiating compassion as though we could go back in time and wrap our own arms around us in that care right when we needed it. Connecting to the body and noticing how it feels to hold this challenge and difficulty, to hold ourselves in love. If you feel a lot, that's okay. If you don't feel a lot, it's also okay. Just practicing this turning towards and meeting what's hard with love. Couple final breaths here. Releasing the memory. And tuning in to the felt experience in the body. And just as we can send compassion to the past, we can also send it to the future. It is very likely that in the future, once again, we will meet with circumstances in which we feel threatened or defensive or afraid. And we may once again act in a way not in accordance with our, our greatest hopes and dreams of kindness and care. Imagining this future self once again succumbing to this rumination and self-criticism. And as though we were practicing for that time and that moment, once again, turning ourselves towards this future experience with compassion, reaching our arms forward to embrace that future self. Each breath drawing in compassion and radiating compassion. Imagining the possibility we could feel the pain, but maybe reduce some of the suffering with this care.
until we are fully awake, we will experience these mistakes, these regrets. Finding an inspiration to really strengthen this capacity to care for our own mental suffering. Feeling the body and again, inviting the body to be infused with compassion as though this whole body is a body of compassion. Releasing this vision of a future self and returning here to this moment. And considering if here, in this moment, maybe this day or this week, there is an experience that we're having in which we are ruminating. Maybe feeling like we didn't do enough or we aren't enough. Creating that additional mental suffering. It's okay if you can't think of anything specific. Just sense real care towards this aspect of ourselves which can't fully love and accept us. This doesn't mean we don't want to change and improve, do better. But let's start on the ground floor of just caring about our own suffering. Continuing breath by breath, inviting compassion here. What if in this moment, everything was already okay? Thank you for your practice.
very high level practice, very tender. It can be to turn towards these parts of ourselves. Some of you may know this story. It's become almost like a fable in the world of compassion. But I just wanna bring it forth here. There was a meeting with the Dalai Lama and, and some contemporary teachers of meditation, including Sharon Salzberg, Jack Kornfield, Joseph Goldstein, you know, all the hits. So in the early 90s, and actually Alan Wallace, who I mentioned before, was translating for the Dalai Lama. And Sharon Salzberg said, I've been teaching a lot of self-compassion self because I've noticed a lot of my students hate themselves. They don't have self-love. And Alan is translating the Dalai Lama and he looks very confused and they're talking and the Dalai Lama turns to all his monks in the back and they talk for a while. And 15 or 20 minutes later, he says to the group, you hate yourselves? Your students hate themselves? She was like, uh, yeah. And looked at all the other teachers and like, yeah. And he was like, self-compassion. <laughs> not actually something taught in the Buddhist canon, you are included in all compassion practices. You don't need a self-compassion. And yet we do, <laughs> right? And maybe self-hatred sounds strong. I think she also mentioned self-criticism and, and otherwise, but it's um, a really important foundation for us to, to keep working on. There's no, I don't think there's a, a time in which we've just, graduated with our self-compassion practice. For many of us, the conditioning is really strong from society or our family or whatever else that there's something wrong with us, like wrong until proven right, right? Uh, and, you know, I remember us talking about joy the other week, Dean, you were saying, God, the joy just snuck in there. And, but I didn't feel like it was mine to have because it just snuck in, right? And I think with compassion too, we think, Gosh, do I get to be compassionate? No, wait, don't I need to deserve that or earn that? Um, so it can be really, really tough. I'd love to hear from folks, any, any reflections on that practice, something that was new or interesting, something that was hard or surprising. Um, for folks online, I can pretty well see your little yellow hand or your hand hand. And Noam, if you see something in the chat, just let me know. Okay. Anyone have a question or reflection? They are bravely willing to share into this Sangha. Yes, Jason, do you want to use this mic? Oh, yeah. People uh. will love it. <laughs> it's a hit. It's not on. You still got to turn it on. Or maybe it Ready? sounds on. Oh, very Britney Spears. I like yeah. it. Did you hear me okay? Yeah, I, I was, um, this is perfect. Thank you for this. The timing of this couldn't be better because I was writing in my journal just before I came here and I said, I feel like a really bad person. Mm. And I, I, I don't think it's self-hate as much as it's like, I did something really stupid. Mm. And this is true that in the recent history, a couple of days ago, I, I did something that I wasn't aware of was really stupid until I got caught doing it and it turned into an incident, you know, mm. and, and I, and I always shocked, I shocked myself. I was in shock. Mm. It happened. And it was as simple as taking pictures in a water play area for kids. No. Oh. And I didn't realize that I was doing it. I was more excited about just being there and taking pictures. It didn't seem like I was violating anything, but of course I was. Mm. and I should have known better mm. and I'm a professional should have known better mm. and uh, it was so hard and I'm I'm ruminating I've been ruminating for two days yeah and I'm still and like so the self-compassion is you know I, I'm sitting there going like wow this is it's like a war yeah a war going on yeah and I don't I keep thinking I'm okay I, like I love it at the end we said you know imagine it's already okay and i'm doing that at the same time i'm 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 still dealing with the fact that this might have repercussions mm. and so i don't know quite i just i just wanted to comment on that because it's so real yeah 
and I don't know, I don't, my practice is not, I, I don't know if my practice is, is able to really, like it's time, sometimes it just takes time, mm. but I'm, I'm wondering if there's any like, if, 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 I think this is the right practice, but I'm wondering if you can even uh, talk more about it. Yeah. And maybe, you know, just, I yeah. think it's just something like, I, I feel like I'm carrying this and I'm, I didn't talk, to, I haven't talked to anybody about it. Mm. So I'm happy to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Right. And I do think it is, um, you know, it sounds like a very painful and very real example. And, you know, there's a couple aspects to it that I'd say are general. And then of course, some that will be specific, but in general, when we find ourselves with that, you know, oh my God, I'm, how could I not, how could I have done that? Like, as though we weren't allowed to make mistakes. And it kicks up again, early stuff for us, for most of us, right? It's, it would be one thing if it just was, you know, the first time we'd ever been criticized or the first time we ever experienced a sense of God, not being good enough, not being smart enough. Um, but for many of us, that's a, a familiar feeling. And so it's digging into these archives, right? And it's bringing forth this, um, this material that's, again, unmetabolized. Even if our parents were doing their very best, they were not enlightened people, right? And that's the best of circumstances. Um, and so it is really hard for you know us as little porous psychic beings to not receive the world as, as sending these messages to us that it's ours. And I think that's just such a normal part. I do think, you know, another piece is it does sound like there's a bit of a threat mode going on for you there. And again, very useful physiology for us to be able to focus and like narrowly focus, you know, like a dog on its ball, like that's the thing, right? When we feel like it might threaten our very well-being. And so there's an interesting, you know, one of my um, dear mentors and, and friend is uh, Alyssa Eppel, and she talks a lot about stress reappraisal. And it's reappraisal is, is really the Dharma. Compassion is a reappraisal, right? It's a way of shifting our mind because guess what? The world doesn't often shift for us so we can shift our mind. And one stress reappraisal, and I'll, I'll see if this sounds like it might be useful, is this is my body doing what it's supposed to do. I'm stressed in order for me to be able to do what I need to do, which is focus on this and, you know, be clear. And it sounds like maybe there's a, a little bit too much right now, but to not fight against the fact that that arousal is here. It's here for a reason. You know, you're worried about repercussions and, you know, you yourself are going to have to figure out if those worries are real and true or real, but not true right? The Sokni Rinpoche invitation to us to check out when we are caught in that emotional loop that feels real, that's giving us that enormous response. Is it real now or is it actually a memory? Is it real but not true? So I would say the, you know, this stress is here. It's like supporting me. And then that this might be real but not true. And that's, a you know, again, that's what we can do in the moment, in the moment, in the moment, so that you could do a practice of holding yourself in love, because I agree, that is a, like amazing opportunity for that practice, right? It's life offering you yet another opportunity for growth, right? The AFOG. And um, it's just, it's just really tough. I, I have been there. I ha I mean, so many times and in that ruminative cycle, like, how could I? I know better. Has anyone in this room not experienced that? I want to know about your life, right? All of us have experienced it. It's um, thank you for letting us hold you. We are here with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else reflection on that practice? questioning whether self-compassion is really worthwhile in the first place. Yes, Ron, thanks. Yeah.
Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can you all hear him? Great, thanks. Well, um, again, uh, my second experience sitting with you was exactly what I needed. Mm. Spoke to exactly what, <laughs> what um, I had an experience. I didn't have to go far yesterday. Um, and it, and 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 there was some some beating myself up about it, and there was also, I mean, I, I've uh, so I've been in a space a lot recently. I feel lucky, and you know, it's it's part of you know practice and and and, and what I've been doing. But I've been been in a space where I've been very okay with things as they are mm. a lot of the time. And, and then there's times when I'm not yeah. <laughs> and, and the contrast is stark <laughs> Yeah. and, um, and uh, so, you know, when I, I ended up doing something that I'm actually not ready to talk about specifically, but, um, but it happened in the, in, in an instant, yeah. it was a, um, it was, it was just a knee jerk reaction to something that happened. And, um, and the other party involved, it made me afterwards, I was able to have compassion for their thing that caused me to have this reaction because I realized that their thing was also a in the moment yeah. reaction. Yes. That, that, that I, uh, yeah. So that, mm. yeah, I, I was able to see that. And I actually was able to try to practice something like what we are doing tonight unsuccessfully yeah. there, there was there was a lot of rumination and and so um you know I got through it and I I, I gave myself a little love <laughs> right I gave myself a little forgiveness yeah you know I I I, I knew enough to do that but but it, it was it, I was spinning mm. you know a bit and and it kept coming back and 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 was totally available for me tonight yeah to to go in there and then, then the next part when we went into like, well, what about like right now? I, I just, I just noticed like road rage is gone for me. I don't have road rage anymore. I used to get out of my car and <laughs> yell at people. I, you know, that's, and, and then that developed into where I would turn the car off and block somebody as I read the newspaper, which wow. I thought was totally, you know, this passive aggressive um, road rage. <laughs> I, 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 I felt so evolved when I started road raging that way instead of screaming at people. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but now, you know, I'm noticed I was, I was being a little hard on myself. What I was judging myself mm. about today was there was a couple things in traffic that were really ridiculous. And I, you know, and and I let go one and another. And then when I finally yeah. had to give somebody a little toot on the horn to let them know, it wasn't a little toot. It was a bah, 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 bah. yeah, like like three times in a row Yeah, where, you know, it's just just a little bit, you know, elevated over what and then wave at them and say hi as I go by, you know, <laughs> but but just just a little more. And, yeah. and, and so that was my present self yeah. that I was able to give compassion to because I don't like that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thank you for illuminating all of that. For yeah. Me. Wow. Thank yeah. you for yeah. sharing with us. And yeah, I think there. I think one thing I really want to want to lift up from what you shared is you were able to have compassion for that other person involved in this situation. And uh, it's so important to be able to have that perspective and point of view. And to really, you know, break down the barriers of who's right and who's wrong. And um, it's amazing that we can have compassion for someone who made us reactive, but not compassion for our reactivity. And so it is, you know, this is again what, you know, Mason and I were talking about is can we have compassion for others and not have it for ourselves? We can. Not advisable, right? Not, you know, because still we're suffering. Another thing I really want to highlight is we are always going to regress to our our least likable versions of ourselves under stress. So if we had a big emotional incident the day before and we're still in that shame cycle, 
today we're not going to have as much kind of like cushion, you know, and we might just be more reactive and kind of go into that. Um, yeah, it's really hard. And, you know, for a lot of us who occasionally struggle with not sleeping so well, that's a really easy one to kind of perpetuate a cycle of feeling not good enough, not okay, something's wrong. It's amazing. Like not sleeping, like something is wrong. And then your whole day is like, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. And just getting in it. And again, just that simple gesture. I, I think you mentioned doing like some somatic work. Is that right? Hakomi or... So it's like being able to touch, right? Literally touching ourself, it gives a release of oxytocin. Bonding. I mean, more than that, there's new research on oxytocin. We won't get into it. But at least one aspect is that it really helps us feel connected. And we can do that for ourselves. And it seems so simple and so silly. We could take whatever we got because that spin cycle it is unbelievably powerful, right? No, what is it? I can't remember um, the exact quote, but you know, there is no army as tireless, as persistent, as like pointed as our own mind turned against itself. It is just incredible. And so again, we can talk about why from the point of view of evolutionary psychology, and probably we can throw capitalism in there as to why it's even worse now, but this is what it is. So we have to use the tools that are available for us. So thank you, Ron. Yeah. Oh, no. Was there a hand up or there's something in the chat there for us? Uh, no, I raised my hand and then I lowered it. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, well, I was thinking about how this was this idea of, you know, self-hatred or needing to to work on self-compassion seems to be culturally specific while they're like you know you 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 said there's we can talk about evolutionary reasons for it and yet you know the dalai lama was surprised to hear that this was an issue right and and i feel like um i'm thinking about what jason was saying something happened recently to me where I did something that I, I really, I really had no idea was going to cause a problem for someone like it was a totally innocent thing to do, but it was a mistake. And the person let me know that I had made a mistake. And I apologized very sincerely. And I sort of was trying to, I was really like paying attention to you know, how many second arrows I shot at myself, you know, and, and yes, I just sort of like, okay you know as that does that mean i'm a bad person i mean i it was it was very it was an easy one to to do because it was very innocent it wasn't like oh yeah i should have known better i just didn't know mm -hmm. I did something that i didn't know would would cause a problem for someone else um but but that's what i was raising my hand to say earlier but but i'm thinking just about how we respond to I mean, I guess I'm thinking that this idea of like, that there is something wrong with you when after you do by doing something wrong, you ha you are a wrong person that that that's yeah. kind of just very culturally embedded. It doesn't like the feeling that that feeling I had of shoot, I really feel bad that I hurt this person and that I did something that I think that feeling like what you were saying to Jason is an important feeling to have. So I don't make that mistake again. It's important to to know when you've done something wrong so you don't do it again right that is important yeah but it doesn't need to need <laughs> to to be then some kind of proof of my badness and yet i think yeah. those messages all the time in our culture i know i did you know growing up yeah but i but i think that's cultural i don't think it has to be that way it doesn't have to be that way I, I believe that to be true. And yet I do think you're pointing to something really important. Like first, I just want to uh, highlight the, the second arrow. It's such a beautiful teaching for mental suffering. So for many of us, it's a really familiar teaching, but this idea that we can experience something like disappointing someone or um, losing our job or, you know, some, some mishap uh, of great or minor um, experience can happen. 
And then we can have that. That's like getting shot with one arrow. It's like, oh, that really hurts. And then the second arrow is the story we create on it. Right. It's and that second arrow, as is famously said, is that's where we have our work to do. I've heard it say the second arrow is optional. Mm, I, I, <laughs> you know, as we were talking about the spin cycle, we don't have a lot of power or control. There's no off button. Right. So optional, let's say workable. It's workable. The first arrow are, is the first noble truth. There is suffering. There is dissatisfaction. There is discomfort. There's going to be a first arrow. So thank you for bringing that up, Noam. And, you know, the other part is if we think about cultural, yes, but, you know, in our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, where all of us lived in tribes that we imagine were 50 to 80 people, it's really good when you feel bad about doing something wrong. Like, oh, I ate this other person's entire, um, you know, stash of berries. <laughs> That feels good, right? And what makes me not eat someone else's food, right? Getting in trouble, you know, but that's kind of costly. So we kind of want to create these norms so that you feel, no, you're not supposed to do that. So we have to create this and enforce in some ways social norms that promote social cohesion. All the parents in the room know that though, of course, children come in with a lot of good, they also need to be like taught and informed how to share how to cooperate. And you do that through, you know, modeling. And also there's, you know, it's thought that guilt has a, a really important aspect of encouraging us to repair. Whereas shame, not so much. Often the shame makes us feel that we are fundamentally bad, not that we did something wrong. So that example, Noam of saying, you know, I did something wrong. My intention was not harmful. Um, how long do I spend spinning out on something that wasn't actually harmful? And I do think that's a good barometer for us because when you are talking about, you know, what's cultural or, or what could be different. Yeah, I, I don't want to wax poetic. I'm not a sociologist or a philosopher. Um, and it's interesting in the Dharma, like if we look at the life of the Buddha and a lot was going on at that time, he also didn't feel a sense of belonging, right? And thousands of years ago, there was enormous inequality and hierarchy. And um, when was this time in which we didn't feel just such a sense of self-alienation? I know it existed. I believe it existed. I have a feeling that when we sensed more kinship with our natural world, we might have understood our relationship to the natural world and place and space. I mean, there's rituals to help us move through. But again, that's just me theorizing. I do know that a lot of these teachings that came out of the time of the Buddha are, are for this kind of level of neuroticness, neurotic consciousness. Why the Dalai Lama hadn't heard of self-hatred is a good question, though. Like, is, there, is it like an issue of semantics, like a different word? Or is it that when you are living in a spiritual community your whole life, that there isn't that egoic sense of a me that could do someone else wrong. There's a sense of, oh yeah, we're all kind of doing this. We, us, ours, not I, me, mine. Um, so yeah, I'm with you on that one, Noam. Yeah. Do I see another hand over there? Hi, nice to see you. Hello. Yeah, nice to see you all. Um, yeah, to... to piggyback off of that Eve I felt like the biggest kind of like relief like somatic relief and like smile come to my mind when you said every person in the world has felt regret <laughs> and I was like oh yeah <laughs> this isn't for me to hold on my own and the like second arrow for me I think is the like or for something that I was thinking about that I went through recently it was like the oh, I'm so, you know, and I hate to use this word, but just like stupid, you know, it's like yeah. I'm stupid totally. for what I'm doing, you know? And like, I, only me has made this mistake. <laughs> and like the ego that's wrapped up in that. Yeah. And like, and um, I was actually just talking about it with my partner um, where that's such a big part of the 12 steps of like working with not being the worst person <laughs> in the room, 
where like a lot of people yeah. think that they are and like how much um ego is wrapped up in thinking like oh I'm actually the worst <laughs> right. um, so anyway when you said that like everybody's felt regret I was like oh yeah that's mm. where I felt like the relief and the sense of like release and everybody's felt all the second arrows too yeah you know so yeah. no it's so beautiful and I think what you're you're verbally demonstrating is how compassion for our own suffering makes us feel compassion for other suffering right it's both that knowing others struggle helps us but it also helps us understand we have all done stupid shit let's be real and that's not a kind word and yet like that is totally the word and i don't know about you but when i do stupid shit i even use my last name instead of my first name and when i talk to myself <laughs> you know and like it's humor is good like it's good to laugh about it because it's like <laughs> it's just like ridiculous you know but it really can linger it can really linger and really get sticky and yeah you know the this this egoic pull that um many of us feel which is so understandable to identify with our experiences it goes both ways it can be an over amplification i'm so awesome or i'm so terrible and in both cases, it's really lacking like a fundamental ingredient for our compassion, which actually is equanimity. And I, I know we've we've talked about that in, in this room. Wow. Talk about a, a somewhat hard to understand and uh, and feel quality of the heart. I feel like equanimity for most people is like, yeah, that one. I don't know. Compassion, loving kindness, joy. Got it. Equanimity. And I think it's quite interesting also, and, and you'll see this written about um, a great deal, that it is like an essential quality of our compassion. We actually cannot sustain, generate, develop, or, or hold our compassion without it. And I'd be curious for from folks, like, what do you think about when I say that? What does that mean that equanimity is an important part of our compassion? There really are not wrong answers. So I would, I'd love to hear any thoughts. Right up here. Thanks friends in the center for using the mic. I know our friends at home really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, good. Good online. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> well, so you and I were having this conversation. I still am not a hundred percent sure if it's, like really the compassion because I was saying like I have so much compassion for other people but I don't have very much compassion if at any for myself so I'm still a little not sure that what it is I feel for other people is genuine compassion if I can't have it for myself I'm hmm. just not sure hmm. because I'm wondering and this is good, kind of about equanimity is that compassion like an urgency for things to be okay, because I don't have compassion for myself. So things feel so not okay. I see. So is it a desire for other people to be okay? So it won't be distressing for you. Right. That's okay. Yeah. Right. So I just, so there's some like equanimity somehow plays into this and then equanimity also plays. So we're talking about like, for sure, I fuck up all the time and do things that are just sort of off the charts to other people. But the kind of behavior that is the worst is what I do to myself, not yeah. even about that. So it's like, oh, I'm a shitty meditator. Oh, mm. like I, we call it in 12 step compare and despair or yeah. like, oh, like I, I haven't been doing my physical therapy for my knee. So I deserve the knee mm. pain. or, um, or like, who am I to, you know, complain about it? Or just like, yeah, just like the litany of not good enough. Yeah, really isn't even outward facing to other people. It's all about like, this idea that I have about who I should be in the world. Yeah. And then, you know, like, or I'm not a meditation teacher. I didn't, I don't like the books that we put in here. <laughs> <laughs> you should feel bad about that. No, kidding. <laughs> Oh, but there is some like kind of equanimity mm. that I get is necessary because to hold like, oh, I'm not a good enough meditator. Like that comes up. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. At least every day. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. I know that equanimity has something to do with it. And I know equanimity in equanimity is something I really don't understand. And I also know it's something that I need. So yeah. I know it's related, but I don't really have anything more intelligent to say about it. No, that's, I think, very well said. Don't go though. Stay. Um, yeah. And I, I am a million percent certain a lot of what you're saying is relatable for people here, maybe needless to say. And I think it's interesting. I wonder if indeed there is no compassion or if there's just like a high expectation, you know, with what you're describing with the the striving with meditation, I should be better, right? You're still meditating. So there's a level, let's hope, of like, this matters. I know it will help me help others. I want to do it. That's compassionate. The expectation it should be better. Yeah, that's striving. But I think um but it's so like the thing you said about that the army, like the most intense army in the world. Yeah. I mean, what I I when I used to actually do counseling with students, I would say, if anybody out there was as mean to me as I am to myself, I would have zero relationship with that being. Yeah. It would be like boundary hardcore abusive no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who else relates to that though? So I, I think, I think, and not yeah. saying it's okay, but I think we can have compassion for ourselves and be hard on ourselves. And so I'm not uh, like, I think it's actually from, for me, and I, I know I shared this here before, but I feel like it's almost a matter of lag time. So I think there was a, a level of, you know, having this idea about myself, like, God, you really blew it like uh I was making dinner last night while we were talking turned out terrible (laughs) so for the record probably we were chatting and um and I did for like a good 30 minutes be like wow you blew like eggplant and tofu like (laughs) this is really okay like why don't you do this why don't you do and then you know at some point I was like it's fine you know it just needs to cook longer right but how long did I let that idea of like you suck you know and so it's not that um I don't have compassion it's like how and so what you're saying maybe is there's the army is uh strong and they have many different battalions but some of them and my question to you is like to notice like where and when is there that kind of embrace or meeting or kindness? They aren't there forever all the time, right? There are gaps. And then like, what is that gap? And is that gap a sense that you can not feel pride about, but spiritual confidence about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it really does help me. Like, I feel so grateful that I started my path in the Tibetan, the Vajrayana world, because the iconography is so rich yeah right like in the and the and the d the well the the dakinis and the taras and the like i mean green car just like loves everybody yeah right like no matter how much i thought right and so it's super easy for me to call her it's super easy for me to call her and it's super easy for me to be like oh if green tara were around in my life she'd actually be a green dragon right like just because that's cool and i like green dragons and so then i can call it green dragon yeah yeah so So you're visualizing your compassion which is great and like you know i often experience you know compassion or loving kindness through the sunlight through the wind right call it in wherever it makes us feel gentle so i just also wonder like how can we experience it and you have a very strong powerful mind so like how do we feel it in the body without the concept like where can we go to feel Mm. that sense of being held and then like literally wherever we feel it just to to savor it i will say the the equanimity piece i I imagine from what you're describing is um knowing it'll change and knowing that whatever is the thing that your mind army is is on about is so complex not you it's like all these things right that interdependence and i feel like calling that in really gives such a richness to our compassion because we recognize that everything's changing and you know we recognize that other people are involved and we're involved and these systems are just huge 
huge systems. Like that's the relief I feel. That's like the home ground. So, that's helpful. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, when when you said at the end of the meditation, uh, imagine that it's all already okay. That that feels like equanimity. Is that yeah? Is that kind of the heart of it? Well, I think that's one part of it, and that's why I was so curious to hear from folks here, um, especially your lived experience of equanimity, because I I think oh good, <laughs> bring it on. One, two, and three, go. Okay. Yeah. No. Oh, I didn't hear them say, yeah, Denise has a comment I'd like to read. Okay, out. please. For me, equanimity makes compassion easier, like holding everyone in love, even myself, mm. those hardest to love in the moment, and recognizing our interdependence and the love melts the sting. Thank you. Hmm. Beautiful. Do you want to use that thing? Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I really enjoyed the meditation and uh, I like the physical part first because I noticed I had a lot of like stress in my shoulders and I was just like, oh, I'm terrible. I should take better care of myself. I need to do better. And it was nice just to sort of like notice mm. that and let that go. Mm. Um, so thank you for that. And for the equanimity, I... I don't think I even knew equanimity existed until I started like coming here. <laughs> and so it's been a while now, but as I was thinking about it earlier, I think um, equanimity sometimes gives me the energy mm. uh, for compassion and makes it uh, somewhat easier mm. to access. Yeah. And so that's really yeah. all I had to say about it. Beautiful. That, uh, yeah. Is it like a word or a phrase or a feeling? Just curious. Um, I think the word equanimity really mm. sticks with me because it's one that like I hadn't heard. Yeah. And I was really curious about, um, you know, like you said, I knew loving kindness, yeah. compassion. And then, so I really like mm. hung on to that yeah. um, since sort of starting down this path. And yeah. So I do think about that and sort of, the balance and the togetherness and that helps I think give mm. the energy for it to, to not get bogged down yes yes and yeah. rumination and all the other stuff yeah so that it's accessible yeah hmm thank you for sharing yeah, yeah. I love it first person testify okay. equanimity <laughs> yes Hi, Julia. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for coming. Like this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I loved your talk. And I'm just hoping to come here regularly. So I'm glad to have found you today. <laughs> I was right with you for a while. Thank you for talking. Great. Um, when you said the word equanimity immediately, I was sort of like, I struggle a bit with self-compassion with apparently everyone. <laughs> yeah. And what it hit me when you said the word equanimity, that like for me, equanimity stems stems from my like sense of self-worth. Mm. Like an inherent sense. Mm. And that's something that is not doesn't always come naturally to me. Um, it's something I've experienced just through like lengthy meditation periods. Yeah. But apparently some people always have like an inherent sense of self-worth which sounds really cool yeah fun. sounds great um, they don't come here <laughs> <laughs> but it's because they don't really exist so, yeah, so I guess my question there is like, so I've experienced this in medicine journeys and meditation retreats. And when I can access that place, mm. I'm inherently really good. Yeah. A beautiful being. Yeah. And my actions, when I, when I don't like the way I'm behaving, that doesn't 
seen that like beautiful being isn't there. It yeah. Means I'm not connected to that beautiful being. Yeah. And I can, I mean, I can see that so easily with other people. So, yeah. But it's, it's tough for me. Like I can't decide what comes first. The self-compassion, the equanimity, or the self-worth. And yeah. it feels to me like the self-worth is sort of the foundation for all of it. Mm. And so I'm, this might be a large question, but you could answer over like a year-long course. <laughs> yeah. But do you have tips for building mm. like in or like accessing inherent self-worth? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful question. And um, thanks for sharing your, your, your felt experience of equanimity. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I hadn't necessarily thought about it as that, you know, intrinsic okayness, but yeah, like it gives rise to that quality because it's unconditioned, right? It doesn't need um, to be fed from something we do or that we are, that we achieve. And I also think with, you know, with equanimity, um, we don't feel better than and we don't feel worse than, you know, there's that equalizing aspect. And that's why it like gives rise to that ability for unconditioned compassion, where we break down all the barriers. What I hear you describing is also, you know, what I've um, heard teachers like Chogyam Trumpa describe as a spiritual confidence. And it's a sense of confidence in our practice and in our path, not in us. And it's almost like we are lending trust to the teachings and that, you know, well, and it, and it's funny, trust is like, trust is hard and to trust in the teachings that they're wholesome and that our following of them is wholesome. Like that gives rise to such great confidence. And I think it sometimes can come more easily around, you know, like when we have those spaces of retreat or medicine work where it's truly like Matthew Ricard says, the dust is just off the gold. Right. So the the essence of who we are is is just more available. And when I said that, you know, people who experience ongoing self-confidence don't come here, it's because they don't exist in this planetary realm. And, you know, we all of us go through a period of maybe 15 minutes, an hour, a day. Maybe we get even five years where we feel that, you know, sense of like, it's all good. It's all working for me. You know, and it's usually when that fantasy and delusion, because it really can't last, breaks down that you first start coming here, right? So the Dharma really does hold people who are finding that the material promise of what we're told will make us happy really rears its ugly head when we lose something we care about, right? Our health, someone we love, we sense the reality of, you know, our... um profoundly unequal structures, our climate catastrophe. And we're like, wait, what more? Right. And so it's interesting. So the tip, the, uh, you know, the hot tip, I guess, is really to start finding that sense of trust in the teachings, which you can't force, but there's that feeling when you were reading, you know, a book and these teachings, they are so simple. Like we come here and we talk about the same thing every time, but it's new because it's like we're changing and the context matters. Context matters so much. So when we find a, someone, a teacher or a teaching that we can read and it's like, oh my God, that's exact. That's it. I didn't know how to put words to it. It's there. That gives us that confidence, I think, you know, and um, I feel for myself when I have that sense of spiritual confidence, I feel it in my entire like gait, like how I walk how I move through the world. And it's just such a, such a joy and so great to have glimpses of it. And we may not get, again, these sustained periods of it in harder times in our life when we're going through stress and challenge. But um, yeah, obviously, if you keep coming back here, you'll get it no matter what. It's a guarantee or your money back. <laughs> Good thing it's donation. No, but um, I do think if anyone hasn't had that experience, to keep an eye out for it, that sense of spiritual confidence, that sense of trust in the teachings and that following them is wholesome. You know, not the teacher, the teachings, you know, these simple truths over and over. So thank you. Yeah. Jimmy, were you that last hand? Oh, we've got five, we've got six whole minutes. So you just cut yourself off. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, I, I, I was really glad when, when you brought up the idea that stuff is really complex. Because I found myself in the meditation trying to sort out what's been going on mm. with, me with some of this stuff. And I realized that <laughs> for the last two days, I've been standing under the waterfall mm. of second efforts. It's just been like this, just a walk mm. in them. You know, I've had a, a, an interesting experience, and, um, and I just turned it into a whole, it's real, but is it true mm. kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, The aspect of equanimity that came up for me during this experience was every now and then in the last couple of days, I'd be like, wait a minute. <laughs> I could be jiving myself, absolutely. <laughs> and um, hmm. and that's, that gives me actually a lot of comfort yeah to realize that i'm confused about this i may not be seeing any of this correctly at all mm. and that's and that's such a relief as opposed to what used to go on with oh yeah this is fucked up mm. and i know it is and you know yeah being really sure yeah. of how fucked up the shit was. <laughs> and um, that's, you know, it's just not necessarily so. Yeah. So mm. I really, coming here, hearing the Dharma, having that experience mm. of it um, really helps me to remember that and mm -hmm. to have those moments of clarity in the midst of really washing machine mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I really, really appreciate mm -hmm. everybody being here. Yeah. Thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. And, you know, you're really highlighting here that this clear seeing, this wisdom that can come through with our compact, you know, the two wings of the bird. And to be able to see that a lot of these self-limiting beliefs, a lot of this criticism is total bullshit, right? And and we can even have compassion for that and care for that. And I do think it it is enormously empowering to be able to see through these projections and these delusions. And, you know, for many of us, our our what psychologists in the developmental field would call like our internal working model, our belief of who we are and how we are in this world. At some point it worked really well. And sometimes it still does. And for many of us, it, re it really needs an upgrade and compassion is a great upgrade when we give ourselves that tenderness and then we can see clearly because compassion, right, has 999 arms. So it's not always going to be the warm embrace that we sent to ourselves. Sometimes it's going to be cut it out. It's enough, right? And so I think we get that clarity on when we need to really hold ourselves and, and when we might need to just see it as it is um, and see underneath. Wow, so rich this evening. <clears throat> I will say, I just, I feel, I feel so, I, I said this at the beginning, but just feel so lucky that we get to be here together. And when I think about the revolution that is needed in this country and in this world to transform, it starts with our communities of care. And this is a community of care. And I really appreciate that. So let's take a moment and dedicate our time here together. reconnecting to our body and our breath and why not just placing a hand on the heart to really seal in 
a sense of connection, kindness. Noticing what might have shifted and changed in the body since we first arrived here. I'm dedicating any benefit of this work, any ways that we could radiate out compassion, clarity, love, and kindness. Let's dedicate that this work is for the sake of all beings, to know their own worth, to feel connected and care, that all beings could be free. Thank you all. Super special, extra hot fire tonight. Appreciate that. Nice thank tweak, so Chandra. Thank you. I think Chandra's doing feeding your demons. Oh, hey now. So <laughs> work on your demons this week. Find them, bring them, feed them, meet your ally. Okay. Thank you.